In a recent video, Canadian Prepper built a mini house to be used as a bug out location from a kit. If you're thinking about buying one of those kits, there are some big red flags that you need to be aware of before you do. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind cause it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. In this video, I'm going to be reacting to Canadian Prepper's recent video that he released that documents him putting together a retreat cabin for himself. It was put together based on a kit that he received and the idea is that he put it together so that if he ever needed to bug out or go to a, like a different location to get away from his primary residence, he would have this place as a place to bring himself and to bring his family. Before I get into that, I wanna talk about two really important things. Uh, the first one regards, you know, do I even have any qualifications for having an opinion on this topic? You know, there's far too many people on YouTube that always offer opinions, and there's really no reason why their opinion should be of any value to anybody because they just don't know anything about anything. Uh, for myself, my professional training is as a photographer, a videographer, and a special effects artist. Now, that doesn't, you know, scream, you know, this is the kind of person I wanna listen to when it uh, comes to, you know, uh, you know building uh, post-apocalyptic retreat uh, structures, but I do have a lot of experience in creating this type of stuff. This house that you see here is the first house that I ever built. I built it several years ago. I built it as a kind of, uh, you know, off-grid kind of retreat structure with a lot of sustainability and kind of prepper mindset ideas built into it. Following that, I built this uh, small, tiny house, which I used as a shed, but I created it in a way where it could also be used as a small house with a you know place for a bed up in the attic area, and uh, you know I had a, a lot of features that would make it to be a very comfortable house. Following that, I built a second version of a full-size house, and I'm living in that right now. I'm shooting this, this video right here in one of the greenhouses that is attached to the side of that structure. After I built that structure, I built another tiny house, and that was the same kind of thing. I used it as a shed, but it was built so it could be a very comfortable and well-insulated uh, tiny house. And at the time of this recording, I'm building yet another structure that is being built as a chicken coop, but it could also be used as, you guessed it, a tiny house. So I've built a lot of structures structures that fit this kind of bill as being kind of off-grid, uh, you know, low energy kind of input structures that would be good to use during an emergency. I've learned a lot doing uh, a lot of these builds and, uh, you know, all the structures have worked out really well. So that's where I come from. If you think that someone like myself has anything to offer to you, because I've been doing this for such a long time and I've built so many structures, you know, please feel free to continue to watch this video. Uh, if you don't think that that makes me qualified, then this would be the time to turn it off. The second thing that I wanted to talk about is that while the uh, the thumbnail uh, image for this video, and I'm sure the title is something very, very negative. Most of this video, uh, most of this video review is going to be very positive. Most of the stuff that I saw in that video uh, was I had very positive feelings about, especially just the simple fact that Canadian Prepper decided to do this. There are so many people that uh, you know just never get off their butt and do anything. And even if there are things that he did in this video that I thought uh, you know maybe weren't the best idea or have some problems associated with them, the simple fact that he got off his butt and he did something is that's huge and there are so many people that don't do that there are so many people that just kind of uh, hang out on YouTube and uh, go down into the comments and will just rip into other people uh, that are doing things uh, you know and sometimes they have like an actual legitimate uh, you know point they, they, they'll be saying well you know uh, you know you did this thing and you know you should have done this and you, but instead you you know you did what you did and you know this other thing would have been better um, and that's kind of the extent of how far they go. They just sit and they criticize other people and they never get off their butt and do anything. So I think it's awesome that Nate actually got off his butt and he actually put the thing together. That puts him in a category well beyond the majority of people out there. And you know, are there some issues with it? I think that there are, but he did it. He did it and he deserves enormous credit just for doing that. And I'm sure he learned a lot while doing it and while he uh, you know, experiences what it's like, uh, you know, I know he's not going to live in that structure, but uh, you know, he, I'm sure he'll be in and out of it, and he'll kind of see it uh, changing over time, see how it responds to weather and the seasons and everything. He's going to learn so much in the future just by having done that and having that kind of physical experiment playing out in front of him. So. Most of what I'm going to be saying here is positive. There are some concerns that I had, but you know, that's a big thing. You know. Get up, get off your butt, and do stuff because you learn so much doing things that way. And even if something is only 90% great. 90% is better than zero. So let's jump right into the video here. I've got a computer uh, right here in front of me. 
Uh, and I, I'm going to be pausing this thing occasionally as I go, um, just so that you guys can, uh, you know, um, you know, maybe uh, listen more fully to a thought that I have. But otherwise, we're just going to be watching this uh, video together with him, and uh, and I'll be uh, sharing my thoughts with you guys. I've got earbuds, so you guys don't have to listen to it. it starts off here with, um, you know, Nate's. Uh, Nate always ta starts off a lot of his videos, uh, you know, he's not starting this off uh, as though it's going to be a construction and a carpentry kind of video because, uh, you know, Nate's smart and he knows, you know, most people aren't going to watch a video like that. So he kind of sets it up talking about, you know, the fear things. He, he starts with the fear that motivates people to maybe want to watch the video and then he tries to, you know, sneak those vegetables in. He promises candy, you know, fear porn, but then he tries to sneak in the vegetables. So he's comparing uh, what he's doing to kind of the simple bushcrafting kind of idea that like you won't have any plan. I'm gonna pause this right here. Uh, this is a structure that he built. Uh, just as a side note, I mentioned that my training is in special effects. These solar panels that are on the uh, roof there, they added those later in post. Uh, they did some motion tracking and put those guys in. Uh, it's the same kind of technique that I used on my alien invasion series for putting uh, spaceships up in the sky. You you'll have the computer kind of track the motion of a shot and then it'll stick something in the shot. Uh, you know, in my case, it was you know a flat image of a spaceship up in the sky, and in this uh, in this case, it was a, a flat image of a solar panel. In fact, you look at all these solar panels, and I think it was one solar panel that they multiplied out um, what seven times here, because you, you'll notice like the inconsistencies of the colors are they're all they all have exactly the same inconsistencies and in, inconsistencies in them, and that's going to be the last bit of a special effect uh, uh, shop talk that I'm going to be uh, dumping on you guys. But I thought that was interesting that they, they took the time to put in these solar panels, uh, you know, as a special effect because they plan on doing that in the future. All right. So these are some really nice shots, really nice, beautiful spaces that they've got uh, going on here. And uh, 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 props to his camera crew. These are really nice, uh, smooth shots here. Okay, I'm just going to uh, back up here just a, a second or just that shot that we just saw. We'll go back to it. Uh, this is going to be a big part of his video, and this is a huge part. Yeah, right there. Uh, this is a huge part if you do your own build. Is uh, you'll see that the all the wood in this uh, bundle that you get delivered to you, it's just all random pieces of wood. Uh, you, you see, you know, one, one of the pieces is uh, kind of thick. It looks like a one and a half inch board. Uh, there's some thinner pieces, some three quarter inch boards. Uh, this is something I know that Nate's going to talk about in this video. And it's such an important thing, no matter what kind of build you do, is that when you get all your materials in, it's really important to organize those materials right off the bat. So, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, you know fully what you have and uh, you don't end up uh, you know, eating into the wrong kind of board because you're not aware that you have a more appropriate board. So he's going to talk a little bit about um, you know, organizing lumber, but that's, that's a really important thing no matter what you do is order your lumber, have it on site, but then organize it so you know exactly what you got and you don't uh, surprise yourself by stealing something that you should have used for something else later on. All right, so here are just some beauty shots of putting the thing together. And uh, the time lapse is always fun. This is a, I'm going to show you a time lapse right here. Of uh, uh, this is the time lapse that I recorded for building the current house that I'm in. Time lapses are always kind of a fun thing to do because uh, you, know, you can just take a picture every day and you feel like you're kind of building uh, that kind of time lapse video for yourself for later. <clears throat> the other thing I want to uh, talk about is I, I love uh, Nate's opening animation sequences. Whoever he's got doing those does a really, really nice job. And uh, they've done a, a bunch of different ones for him. And uh, I think they add a lot. Oh, wait. And you can see uh, the whole thing comes in this one bundle. So for this particular kit, that's really cool. When I have been doing uh, my house builds, there'll be a number of lumber deliveries. Uh, it, instead of having all the lumber kind of uh, mixed, it will come as like just, uh, the, you'll get a pallet and they'll just be full of two by fours. And a pallet will be full, uh, you know, just full of one by threes and tongue and groove boards and floorboards and everything. This one is different. It comes all in one gigantic uh, skid. And uh, that's kind of a, a, an, an interesting, uh, a way to do it because it makes the shipping a lot easier and they can kind of ship them from further away and it's just one load.
Right, this is Dean here. Uh, he has a great channel called Arctopia. And Dean, while Nate is not a builder, Dean is a builder. And I'm sure that all the things that I'm talking about in this video, Dean is totally uh, familiar with. And uh, you know, these are not gonna come as any surprise to him. So as I'm going through uh, you know, my thoughts on this video, uh, this is no disrespect to Dean. I'm sure he was familiar with these things. And it's kind of a negotiation where uh, you know, we could do uh, you know, these things that uh, Praxis is gonna be describing during this video, but it's gonna come at the expense of, you know, it'll take more time, it'll take more money. So all this stuff is kind of a balancing act, and I'm sure that Dean was doing the balancing in his head, and I'm, I'm sure nothing I'm saying is a gonna be uh, coming as a surprise to Dean. My partner in crime, Dean from Arcopia. Looks pretty cool. It's pretty compact, like it's, you know, I thought it would be uh, a bunch of things wrapped up, but it's a nice rectangular giant skid of wood. Doesn't get more compact than that. So on day one, we went and we picked up our bunkie. It took this forklift to lift it onto the flatbed. We got her all tied down and we took her to our site. Both the roof and the base layer are the okay. only things that you're going to have to cut. So, uh they're talking about uh, they're about to start talking about the foundation Pick up some a additional bit. materials we went we got some lumber for our foundation okay. the foundation is the first thing that I have a bit of an issue with with the way that they did it and again I'm sure this is stuff that was you know uh, it's not gonna come as any surprise to Dean but as we go through the foundation I think this is the thing that I'm the most concerned with is the way that they did the foundation and um, the point of a foundation is to uh, uh, you know, support your structure and to make it so that it always has kind of a flat base that it can be uh, uh, situated on. And uh, if you don't create a foundation that is impervious to things like frost heaves, it can take your structure and, and almost uh, give it like a slow motion earthquake experience where the bottom is kind of pushing, uh, you know, in different ways and different sides. And, um, this is kind of the big issue that I have with how they did this. And we're gonna see how they did the foundation a little bit. Right now, they're talking about uh, finding a site and a site is a really, or site selection is really important. Uh, one thing that they might be doing uh, is looking at kind of their local environment and trying to find a place that has good drainage because drainage is a really important thing to have uh, when you are uh, uh, you know, gonna build on something. If you have a lot of moisture in the soil, you can be getting a lot of uh, you know, things like frost heaves uh, you know, happening underneath it. So uh, the fact that they kind of skimped on the foundation, in my opinion, in this, they might save themselves by having built it in a place where you know, the moisture in the soil, they, that, that moisture content in the soil is really low. So if that's something that they pre-selected and they just didn't uh, explicitly say it in this video, um, that is something that will kind of tend to save their structure. But um, you know, I, because they didn't say it in the video, I don't really know one way or the other. This is kind of a funny little bit here where uh, Nate's got all his, uh, he's just got food in his, uh, 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 tool belt. I've, uh, I can't really criticize what he has in his tool belt because I just don't like wearing tool belts at all, uh, it, period. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I get made fun of on occasion for that because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just carry a hammer in one hand and a fistful of nails and go scampering up a ladder that way. Uh, I'm just, I'm not a tool belt kind of guy. I just find them awkward and I don't find them very, uh, very comfortable. So, uh, but if I did wear a tool belt, maybe it would all, all be full of, uh, full of food. All right, so they're starting to uh, lay out their foundation here. Um, this is a really important part of the process uh, because this is what kind of uh, determines everything else going up. You wanna, uh, when you start building your foundation, you wanna make sure things are as square as possible because there's always errors that get, in, get introduced to something as it kind of goes up. And uh, you, know, you, you wanna start with the least amount of error as you possibly can. You can see in this image here that they've got uh, their boards uh, kind of laid out. This is kind of their rough, uh, kind of footing foundation kind of thing that's built out of wood. And uh, it's set on top of uh, some uh, concrete bricks or something like that. Uh, when they were setting those concrete bricks, I don't believe they show in this video, uh, what they would have had to do is make sure that they are laid out in a nice uh, you know, rectangular kind of uh, shape so that they're all in the right places. Um, and they also would have wanted to make sure that they were all nice and uh, level with each other. So they would have been taking a, uh, a bubble level or something like that uh, and uh, laying boards out across them and making sure that they, uh, you know, all the, the surfaces of all those um, pieces of concrete are all just at the same level so you're not building on a crooked foundation. And this is again is the thing that concerns me about this is that those are just uh, 
you know, pieces of concrete that are laid out on the ground. Uh, as the ground uh, you know, gets moisture in the winter and as that moisture freezes, if there's more uh, freezing or more moisture on one part of the structure, uh, when water freezes, it expands. You know, that's uh, something that uh, causes the, um, you know, the erosion of mountains. You know, water gets down into cracks, it freezes, uh, you know, breaks those cracks open. Uh, if you've got different sections of ground and there's more or less water in them and they're freezing in different ways, you know, some of the sections can raise up higher as they're freezing more and other sections don't raise as much. So you can have your ground kind of changing underneath your structure in all different places. And this is the reason why when you're doing a foundation, generally what you want to do is, well, all the time, uh, really, you want to uh, get your, uh, your footings, your foundation down beneath where the frost line is so that it's sitting on stuff that's not going to be freezing. And whether you do a continuous wall, which is usually what I like to do, or even just pillars, they could have just done pillars here where they uh, could have like shoveled down. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where the frost line is uh, up in Canada. I'm sure it's deeper than it is around here. Around here, it's like four, four or five feet you want to go down. Um, if they had just shoveled down and then gotten their, uh, you know, uh, their pillars, they could have like poured pillars with concrete, uh, that would have made it so that they could have, you know, gotten below that kind of frost line. And a lot of times even around here, I'll kind of cheat and I won't go quite as, uh, quite as deep with my frost walls. Uh, and I've never really had a major issue uh, with my foundations cracking, uh, you know, even if I'm not going down, uh, you know, quite as deep as, you know, is uh, considered ideal in my area. But I think getting at least somewhat down beneath the ground would have uh, benefited the structure greatly. All right, so they are continuing to kind of lay stuff out. And uh, you can see uh, th that dark colored board that they had there was probably kind of being used uh, as that leveling piece. So right now they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, getting the site all clear, getting it all level. We laid down some landscape fabric just to keep all the brush down, keep any weeds from springing up. We put down some gravel. It probably took us eight or nine loads of gravel to get around a 500 square foot space that we could work with. This now, I have a little bit of concern about what we're seeing here uh, with the landscape fabric and, and the gravel. Uh, one thing the landscape fabric uh, can have a tendency to do is to make it so that the water doesn't uh, go through it as much. And if they have that landscape fabric extending beyond the, uh, uh, the structure of the house, you could kind of get some muddying pools of water. Now, the, the, the landscape fabric does allow the, uh, the water to go through, but as silt kind of gets in there, it can make it so it just doesn't drain quite as well. And that could potentially uh, make a situation where you have uh, almost a, a swimming pool like effect where you have the, the landscape fabric kind of going off to the sides and you have your gravel on top of it and then you put your house on top of that gravel. Now the gravel is going to offer a decent drainage but uh, as the landscape fabric does kind of clog up if rain's falling on the fabric it's and it tends to pool uh, you're going to take water that could have just percolated down into the soil and have it kind of running to some degree underneath your structure. And that could have frost issues and uh, also could have humidity issues because the way they put this thing together, there is um, you know, airspace under there and the water can get under there. And um, you know, I, I, when they were putting together that frame for the base, uh, it didn't scream at me pressure treated lumber. I'm not sure whether it was pressure treated or not. You would definitely want that to be pressure treated, uh, you know, especially stuff that's in contact with the, uh, those concrete pads. Anything with ground contact or near ground contact, you should definitely uh, you know, create out of uh, something that can't be uh, rotted or eaten by termites. This is not only going to be for the footprint of the bunkie, but it's also going to keep a lot of the weeds down around the bunkie and in the front yard where we're likely going to want to put a fireplace and some other odds and ends. For me personally, weeds don't really bother me. I see weeds as a way of uh, sucking moisture up out of the soil and uh, you know, kind of holding the soil together. Uh, so the idea of uh, going through a lot of steps to try to prevent weeds, I, I guess that's kind of uh, discretionary, kind of like a qualitative uh, choice. But in terms of the structure, I see weeds as almost being kind of helpful. Now you don't want trees growing and having their, their roots go underneath those pads that they had because uh, plant roots are another thing that can kind of heave pads up. Uh, you, you know, if you're walking through the city, you'll see the strength of uh, you know, the roots from trees where the, you'll see the tree roots got, kind of going out under the pavement, even cracking the pavement up. So given time, tree roots can really start uprooting foundations as well. This also goes a long way in terms of keeping the bugs down. 
Okay, so we put down landscape fabric, took out all the organic. Yeah, definitely. If you if you're getting rid of some of the vegetation, it does help with the uh, the bugs. And uh, in addition to that, if you're ever uh, working on uh, a situation like this out, uh, you know, in, in a uh, kind of a foresty environment and uh, you want to keep bugs down just having a little fire going off to the side a little smoky kind of fire uh, having that it seems to distract the bugs and confuse the bugs and it really takes a, a really awful situation with bugs and makes it a lot more uh, livable and uh, if you are generating some uh, scrap wood as you're doing your build you're, you have automatic uh, you know fuel for your fire at the same time but you want to put in a little bit of damp stuff too to get a little bit of smoke in the air because that helps with the bugs material underneath and a good four inches of packed gravel. We, Bunky Life so packing is gives you a few options. They don't include a footing, but they make it versatile. You can do a bunch of different things, but I'm going to do it the home builder type way to make sure that it's completely square, mouse proof, waterproof, and I'm even going to insulate the, the floor so it's uh, on Nate's bare feet there. He's going to be nice and toasty in the winter. It took us a little while to make sure that... And then and those are all, those are all really good points. Like I said, uh, uh, Dean's a builder, he knows what he's doing, and uh, you know he, he knows the, the balancing act and the compromises that we're doing here. You can see the bu bubble level that they're using here to try to get the site as level as they can before they even put those pads down. Everything was level, we did some tampering, we framed the foundation. If you don't have one of those machines that he just was pushing around that looked like, kind of like a lawnmower uh, machine, uh, what you can do is uh, take a, a piece of lumber and attach a, like a pad in the bottom and just walk around and stomp that thing down over and over again for a long period of time. Helps you have earbuds and some music in there. You can kind of go to the music, but that's another way of kind of tamping down the soil if you don't have a machine like that. In such a way that it's going to be rodent proof and condensation proof, and it's gonna provide great insulation. For I'm not a fan of this OSB board that they've got on top here. That's the board that looks like, it almost looks like the way solar panels oftentimes have all those little crystals in them. It's the wood that looks like that. It's called OSB, which stands for Oriented Strand Board. It's a cheaper, kind of material. Um, it's a bunch of wood chips, uh, you know, wood waste that is glued together and kind of uh, packed. So it has a lot of economic benefits for it. Uh, I don't tend to like it because if it does get any uh, humidity in it, it is not going to offer um, a lot of protection from humidity. Uh, it can kind of delaminate if it gets uh, too moist and kind of mold up. Uh, and also it doesn't have a lot of uh, um, uh, strength uh, in terms of if you're laying it out like between floor joists, um, it doesn't, uh, it can't take an enormous amount of weight like a, like a, a clear piece of uh, a lumber can. But uh, you know, for this application, it's totally fine. It's just those are those are my general concerns with OSB board floor. We then put treated wood on the outside of the foundation. All right. So that's the treated wood that I was talking about. Uh, I guess it's pressure treated wood that's on the outside. Uh, that'll be where the uh, where the rain comes down the sides and spatters up, they don't want that getting onto uh, non-pressure treated wood. Again, even the stuff that uh, spans the underneath, uh, you know, just with humidity, I'm not sure if they have termite issues up there. It, uh, as you go far, farther north, termites tend to be less of an issue, so maybe they don't. But, uh, you know, having untreated lumber in an uh, environment that has a lot of um, moisture potential in it, um, I, I'd have a little concerns with that. But pressure treated lumber is, uh, you know, it's more expensive to deal with. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's a, a toxic process to make the stuff so uh, you know there is an envir environmental uh, reason to try to use it as little as possible as well. All right guys let's set this thing up. And you know I, I, just, I know I'm stopping this like a million times but uh, the enthusiasm that he has in that shot right there that is a real palpable thing uh, you know if you guys ever do your own build you're gonna feel that you got you know your site is level it's ready you got your foundation ready you got your you know stacks of wood they're all ready to go uh, that it's a wonderful wonderful feeling where it's just like you got a beautiful day and uh, yeah it's a, it's a great feeling I, I would strongly encourage you guys to try this kind of stuff on your own because uh, it's not just so you get a house out of it it's 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 a wonderful feeling the idea of creating this for yourself and the process is also really uh, it can be really uplifting in order for Bunky to minimize shipping costs they have to pack it in a way which is not very organized so the first thing we did was we organized all of the different pieces according to their code and number that is written on every piece of board this was okay um, so this is a little bit different than if you were to uh, build something just with dimensional lumber. Just dimensional lumber is just a bunch of two by fours of certain lengths and a bunch of two by sixes of certain lengths. Uh, what this thing seems to do is that uh, it's almost like Lego pieces. 
where uh, you're, you're not taking a two by four and you need to cut it down to whatever length in order to put it into your build. It seems like this stuff is, it's already cut, it's already notched, it's already ready to go. That's an enormous value that this company is adding uh, to this product, the fact that they uh, have done that for you because it takes all the guesswork out of it and it takes a lot of the uh, possible mistakes out of the process. So that's an enormous value. And there's another part of this that is, is going on that uh, Canadian Prepper didn't mention and anyone who's not a builder wouldn't necessarily even know that this is happening. But in order for them to give you exactly the pieces that you need and you know, you know no, no more, no less kind of situation, um, they need to be hand selecting the lumber and making sure that they're giving you lumber that is, is good quality stuff. Um, because if they're giving you lumber that is unusable, then you're gonna be like short a piece. So one thing that it would seem like this company is doing is that they are hand selecting the lumber for only the best quality lumber. And, and that really means something. When you just order a, like a, a skid full of you know random uh, dimensional lumber, like if I buy a skid of two by sixes, I'm gonna go through that and s many of the two by sixes are gonna be perfectly adequate. They're straight, they don't kind of corkscrew or anything like that. They don't bend or bow or crown in any way. Uh, a few of them are gonna be really, really beautiful boards, but then a few of them are gonna be real garbage boards where they're, they're gonna have corkscrews in them or they're gonna have a really, really severe bow to them. Uh, you know, there, there's gonna be some kind of issues with these boards. Some of them are gonna get, be kind of banged up. And uh, that's, just, that's just a reality. If you order a, a skid full of lumber, some of it's gonna be kind of you know, messed up stuff. And there are techniques as a carpenter that you can use to like compensate for a crown in, in wood or compensate for even a corkscrew. Corkscrews are really the worst, I, in my opinion. Uh, so there, there are things you can do to compensate for these things. But what's going on with this kit is that in order for them to process all this stuff, uh, it looks like they are getting rid of any stuff that's bent or warped or whatever. You, know, you look at the board sitting on the stack and everything that I'm seeing here is really flat, uh, you know, really nice looking wood. And uh, for this kit company to do that, they need to get the raw lumber and they are, they're culling out the stuff that's bad, the irritating stuff, and they're just giving you the good stuff. Uh, so that's a real value added that I think that if you're not a builder, you wouldn't even realize you're getting that value added, but that's a real value added that this company uh, adds to the process where they are just giving you the good stuff. This is a really big value. Organizing is so important. Uh, I've had, uh, in my uh, learning curve doing my building, I've had situations where, let's say I needed a two by four that was, uh, you know, say, um, I wanna say, like I, I, I need a two by four that's um, seven feet long or something like that. And I'm going through my piles of two by fours and uh, I have a bunch of two by fours that are 10 feet long and I find those first and I need a seven foot long one in order to do, to do the build. So I will take that 10 foot long one and I'll cut off three feet of it uh, and that gives me my, my seven foot two by four. You know, it's great, right? I get my seven foot two by four, you know, I, I, I pulled it out of the pile. Well, later on I would go into the pile and I realized that not all the two by fours are 10 feet long. Some of them are eight feet long. And that, the eight foot one was the one I should have grabbed in order to make that seven foot board. And later on, I'm gonna need some two by fours that are nine feet long. And I just stole my 10 foot long one that I was supposed to use for the nine foot ones. Uh, and I ended up wasting it, using it for one of the ones that's seven feet long. So that's why it's really important to make sure you know all the lumber that you have, you have it all laid out uh, properly so that you're not taking boards and cutting them down more than you need to. You're, you're using the appropriate board for the job. And so organizing lumber, it's, it takes a while uh, to do it and you feel like you're not getting anything done, but it's a really valuable step. And it also just makes it easier to find stuff. Uh, so you can just, you start moving faster once you start moving. Life a lot easier later on. So I think we got the hardest part done. We got everything nicely sorted. We unpacked the pallet. That was a bit of a process. First we had to- One thing that's, hard, that's a little challenging for me uh, watching this video is whenever I watch it, most of my YouTube, uh, but specifically Canadian Prepper, I watch it all at double speed and I'm watching it at normal speed with you guys. But uh, it just sounds like he's talking so slow. Together and we're gonna drill those on and I think this should be a pretty well, we'll make it smooth through process. It's sunny, there's no bugs. It's windy, we can't complain There's that enthusiasm it. that I'm talking about. It's a great feeling but starting I'm the sure the communist camera guy is, you know, thinking about something to complain about. So, so right. everything fits together, tongue and groove. So this kind of puts together like Lincoln logs. And you can see uh, these tongue and grooves are a really great way of snugging the lumber up. 
This is pretty important. This block right here, um, when you're putting the, uh, the different pieces together, you, you know, they don't always fit perfectly. You know, one, one tongue will be a little bit wider than, than some groove, so it takes a little bit of work to kind of get them together, and that's a good thing. It makes your structure more rigid for it. Um, so sometimes you want to bang them down a little bit, but you don't want to be banging directly on your lumber because uh, you've got your grooves facing down and your tongues facing up. And as you're trying to push these guys down, if you're hammering on the top, you're going to be banging down your next set of tongues. So they give you these, uh, these beater blocks that you can put on and, uh, and smash down. And I hope they give you plenty of these because, uh, well, <laughs> if you're like me, after you're hitting these for a while, they, they'll end up breaking up. So I, I hope they give you plenty of these. I presume they give you plenty of them. And if you're ever building and it's not from a specific uh, kind of kit, uh, where uh, you know you are cutting up uh, lumber, you know you're going to create your own beater blocks because you'll take some tongue and groove board, you'll cut it down, and you'll using you'll be using some of that scrap uh, as your beater block. And recommend hammering every piece so it's nice and tight to ensure nice tight connections so there's no gaps. Yeah. This is there's always going to be gaps anyway, and humidity uh, gets into this depending on what the humidity level of this wood is as it dries out. Uh, you know, all the boards are going to kind of shrink a little bit, so you want to get rid of as much gap as you can because you know they're going to recede a little as they dry out, and um, you know. Uh, then they'll, they'll open up a little. So you want to get them as tight as you can. And also, as you're going up, it's not all necessarily about keeping them as tight as you possibly can. You also want to keep them nice and horizontal, uh, nice and level uh, as you're going up. So sometimes uh, as you're going up, if you keep putting that bubble level on, you'll realize one of the sides of the wall is starting to rise up a little bit more than the other side. And it's just going to get worse and worse potentially as you go. So as you're going, you're going to want to keep putting that bubble level on there. and um, you know, if you have a side that's rising up, you're going to want to really make sure you bang down the the board on that side as much as you can. And if you, if need be, on the other side that is you know falling behind, maybe uh, you know have that uh, the board on that side you know up just a little bit so that you can keep that kind of uh, horizontal level kind of thing going on. Uh, so you don't have like by the time you get to the second floor, it's like it's up like that because this side just kind of stacked up more. I although. When I'm doing that, I usually try to, instead of focusing on making gaps, I usually try to focus on really get that side down because that, that side was uh, getting a little high. Minimize ingress and make sure that everything fits together symmetrically. As you can see, the walls are starting to get built. What an amazing yeah. sight. And when you have pre-cut lumber like this and uh, you know all, er, everything is all organized, you can see how quickly they go. I mean, this is obviously time lapse, but uh, one, once you get everything organized, you know things will start flying together if you've got it all pre-cut like that. We put in some screws at an angle in the door and the window frames. Then we slid on the doors and the windows. Now, before you put this all together, you're gonna wanna make sure that you remove the set screws from the top of the window. I'm not sure what the set screws refer to. I, obviously, something with the, with these guys, but that it, that um, gets to the idea of the importance of reading through an instruction manual uh, before you start the process, so you kind of have an idea about things that are going to be coming up in the future, so you don't kind of paint yourself into a corner. Uh, this would be one of those things where you know maybe it says like on a later page, make sure you you remove those set screws, or maybe they it did say it on the earlier page of their instruction manual, but they just kind of missed it or whatever. But reading through an instruction manual multiple times and really, really knowing it, internalizing it is really important. Those. I should add that the step-by-step -step instructions and it sounds like they've got good incredibly instructions for easy video. to follow throughout this process. There's an incredibly detailed and well and seeing illustrated them all layout like this. It's uh, it's encouraging because uh, I'm oh. sure that makes it a lot easier. Because Dean is a man of many resources, we are Oh, and he's about to talk about uh, scaffolding. Uh, scaffolding, uh, you know, Nate's talking about in this video that it's helpful but not necessary. Uh, whenever you are working on a wall that's going kind of up like this and you're needing to w work along the top of the wall, it's really handy to have something like scaffolding so you can kind of start on one side and, and move along and not have to constantly like take the ladder down, move the ladder over, continue. Because uh, sometimes you'll need to kind of like hold something down from one side while you're working on the other and it's nice just be able to kind of uh, worm your way across the wall as you uh, are, are doing that. Oftentimes when I haven't had scaffolding I'll just have multiple ladders and I'll leave all the ladders up against the wall so I at least don't have to move the ladder because while at this site they leveled the ground 
and made it so that it, it, I'm sure it's easy to put a ladder uh, down wherever you need to put a ladder down. You know, not, not every site that you're gonna be working on might be all level around the sides. I know that the chicken coop I'm working on right now, it's kind of terraced all around the sides and it is not a level site. Uh, so whenever I move the ladder, it's not just moving the ladder, but I also have to kind of chalk blocks underneath the, the legs of the ladder to make it so that it's stable. So whenever you can kind of avoid that kind of thing and uh, you know just kind of move across the surface, um, that there's a real benefit to that. So that, 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 that's why scaffolding is going to be helpful for something like this. But again, not necessary. Those were finally put on. The most satisfying part was putting that nice long piece yeah, of wood And this just on. locks it all together. When you have uh, these kind of builds that really interlock with each other, the more you put on it, the more it kind of uh, rigidifies it. Bigger than the main floor, as it cantilevers yeah. over the Cantilever, that's a building term that just means that something overextends the floor below. To the second level. These special pieces have notches cut out. The fact that those notches are there, that is, that's huge. Uh, you know, doing notches, it's, you know, you, you got to cut both sides and then, you know, chisel them out with a little chisel, Nate showing off here. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of time saved if they're pre-notching things. Uh, we're at the end of day two, pretty much, and we pretty much... So they've already got an awful lot done. The, the fact that these pieces are all uh, pre-prepared, uh, it really speeds things up. The fact that they have the scaffolding really speeds things up, and it looks like they got a lot of people working on this too. I mean, some of it's camera crew, uh, but uh, having a lot of people can really help with things. Just when you're trying to lift up a board and nail it on one side, sometimes it's really hard if you're by yourself. Uh, you know, you can have even like a, a child, even a child can help you sometimes. Like I'll, I'll, I'll be working, I want to put a board up somewhere and uh, you know, I need to start from one end and then move across. Uh, but it's hard to hold up like a you know, 10 foot long board just from one end. It's easy from the middle, but if you're just at one end, the, the other side's falling down. And it's just so much easier to have an extra person just kind of, they can just hold up that side. It may not even be very heavy, but they, they can just hold up that side, let you kind of tack one side in, and then you can go over and take over. When you don't have an extra person for that, you usually have to take a piece of lumber, lean it up against the wall, and use it as kind of like a, a stand for the wood. Just having extra people uh, really speeds up so many things. There's so many parts of these processes that uh, can be really a uh, pain in the butt for one person, but for two, no big deal at all. It's, it's starting to really get some weight to yeah, it. That rigidity that he's feeling after you get, get the, uh, the top in there. Do it by yourself, but it would be difficult. Three people is gonna be very useful. You can have one person hammering, one person drilling, and one person grabbing wood. One downside of working with multiple people, though, is that um, in some ways it kind of can slow the process down as well, because if they're people that you like, that you know, it, it creates a lot of chit-chat, um, and uh, you know, that's just, it's just a reality of it, so it will kind of slow things down. Uh, and also, uh, if there's any kind of um, uh, amb ambiguity about how to do anything, having lots of different opinions, uh, sometimes it just makes more sense to just set on an opinion and kind of go ahead with it. Uh, when you have to, it's the, it's the old uh, analog too many chefs. That can definitely be a real thing if you have a lot of people. And if you're bringing in people that just uh, are completely untrained, uh, which is fine. Uh, bringing them in for one day, uh, you can find that you spend like you know more than half the day just kind of getting them up to speed about how to uh, you know do whatever you're doing, uh, and then you know if you bring in another person the next day, it's like half the day is spent just getting that person up to speed. If you are going to work with people, it's good if they can be the same person over and over again because then you don't have that kind of uh, waste time trying to uh, you know re-explain what you're doing to each new new uh, person or each new group. Next up was putting in the upstairs window. Up until this point, we haven't had any major issues whatsoever. Everything has fit perfectly well. And the fact that things are still fitting well after it has gone up so far is a testament both to the care of the people putting this together, but also to the process and the, the quality of the materials that are sent out. Uh, as you are moving you know, up through a structure, like I mentioned, you wanna make that foundation as perfect as you possibly can, because errors get automatically added in, in, into whatever you're doing. You know, when, you, when you're measuring something, you know, you, you, you can never cut something off exactly at like eight feet. It's always an estimation. There's always a little bit of error in there. And hopefully, you hope that your errors kind of cancel each, 
other out as you go up. It's like, you know, sometimes you add a little, sometimes you subtract a little, and all things are even. Like uh, we talked about like those boards going up on the sides, you wanna keep them level. Hopefully, ideally, sometimes this side's a little high, sometimes that side's a little high, and it all kind of equals out and it stays level the whole time. But the fact that they're this high and things are still uh, sliding together well, uh, that's a good thing because those accumulated errors are not becoming a problem for them. And that's a testament to the kit and the people putting it together. We put a few more layers around and then we're ready to This get is really nice on looking lumber. Peak. We then started to place and secure the pre-assembled peak pieces. I'm not sure what they mean by pre-assembled. I don't know if they cut, they mean they come pre-assembled from the uh, the manufacturer or if they pre-assembled them on the ground, uh, which would be a sensible way to do it. Um, not sure what they meant by that. Heaviest pieces in your bunky life kit which will require two people to lift are the roof beams. Okay. <laughs> Those look pretty heavy. But, um, you know, if you only have one person and you need to do something like this, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, when I was building my house, we have roof trusses, which is both sides of uh, the roof, uh, which are made out of, well, these look like, I think these are two by sixes, maybe, that they have. So this is three two by sixes um, nailed together. Um, incidentally, the nailing pattern on this is a little, a little interesting. I'll get back to the nailing pattern on that. Um, but uh, when I was doing this place, uh, I was able to uh, erect the, the entire roofing truss, which was made with two by eights, which were something on the order of like 14 feet long. Uh, so it's like 28 feet of two by eights tripled up. Uh, and I was able to get those up all by myself. It was not easy and it took a little bit of work, but uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. If you're gonna be doing this by yourself, don't use the fact that you're by yourself as a reason not to do it. You can always find a way of doing it. It may take a little longer, um, there's always a way of doing it. Uh, I wanted to talk about the nailing pattern on this. You see there's like three nails, three nails, three nails. Um, that, 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 that's fine. Uh, another way of, of doing uh, nailing is to kind of uh, zigzag back and forth across it. Um, that's the way that I usually do it. I feel like it kind of spreads the connection points out a little bit more. I, I don't know whether it makes much of a difference either one way or the other, uh, but uh, you know, it's just a, a difference in style. There are five of these in total. This will be the extent of the heavy lifting that you have to do for your bunkie. If you're Paul Bunyan, you might be able to I do guess this I'm Paul yourself, Bunyan. but you should probably have a friend just to be safe. But I we agree with that advice put in the cross well. bases on the ceiling beams, applied all of the individual... Right. Yeah, you can see right there, I wish I could just go back like a tiny bit. This is one of the things where it's good to have two people. Uh, so he, he's putting it in there, I'm gonna pause it. All right, see what uh, we've got, I think this might be Dean doing the drilling. Uh, putting the screw in and you see what Nate's doing here he's putting a lot of force down on that this is one of those uh, things where it's great to have two people sometimes you do have to kind of force a, uh, a board into shape and I think maybe the fact that they're all the way up on the top here some of those accumulated errors uh, are starting to build up and there are you know there's lumber that's like maybe uh, you got this connection point and something's a little bit higher than it should be or a little bit further out than it should be and it's not a problem because you can just force it back together and screw it and then the, the wood will naturally kind of reset itself if you bend it into place but sometimes it can be hard to both force the lumber and um, and do the screwing at the same time. So this is one of those situations where it's good to have a couple of people, uh, so someone can be doing the forcing and somebody can be doing the attaching. But again, you know, if you're by yourself, uh, oftentimes what I've done is I've like screwed like kind of a lever piece onto a board, like if there was a board that was kind of twisted and I needed to, you know, force it uh, into being nice and plumb before I screwed it in, I would put a big lever on it and I'd, uh, the lever would be down by my feet and I'd use my foot to kind of push the lever so I could tweak the board into straight and I could, uh, you know, uh, do it with a screw gun myself. Um, but again, it's like it takes all the time to set up that, le that lever and attach it and everything. So this is one of those situations where having an extra person can make it go a lot faster, a lot easier. Applied all of the individual roof pieces, which was easy peasy. That's a great feeling once you feel like you have a, a finished structure. And he's got his, his boy helping him. I have my boy help me. I like, he, uh, oftentimes, like when I talk about like that long board, I need someone to just hold it up on one end. It's not super heavy. Having a, like a little kid even, you know, they can just hold that board and uh, and you can do work on one side. So it doesn't even have to be all adults. You know, uh, the, the majority of time that I'm working, it's honestly like I'm calling my boy for a little help. Uh, uh, you know, just doing the tiniest little thing, just kind of roughly line this up while I work on this other side. To add on our metal roof. We then cut our insulation. Okay. So th they're working on uh, insulating under the floor. I guess this is something that isn't necessarily part of the kit, uh, but uh, 
I think that's a great idea. In fact, that's the second big issue that I have with this, uh, this kit here. Uh, the first one, like I mentioned, was the idea that they did not put uh, good footings down, uh, where frost might be an issue over time. Uh, and the second thing is that there is little to none in terms of insulation on this structure. The wood itself has some insulating value, but if you can add insulation to a structure, it is going to make it so much easier to heat and keep that area cool uh, during different times of the year. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times people associate uh, insulation with like, you know, people that are like, you know, uh, you know, liberal, liberals that want to save the world and everything. It's like, you know, like how many, uh, how many yards of insulation are you going to put on your structure? And there's definitely diminishing returns. The first in inch of insulation does way more uh, benefit to you than the second inch of insulation does. Uh, you know, if, you, if the first inch of insulation gives you like a 50% reduction in your heat loss, the second inch of insulation is only giving you like a 25% uh, increase in that. And the third inch is only giving you like a 12.5% uh, uh, benefit to you. So there's definitely diminishing returns, but having some insulation on there is really important and as you'll see uh, in this video they did not put much insulation in this structure it's fine it's better than nothing it's better than nothing and it's great that they're doing this but if they were able to add uh, some extra insulation to the structure it would be an enormous benefit uh, to the amount of fuel that they would have to create for this because if they put a wood stove in there um, if they can cut their fuel uh, consumption by half and if this thing uh, takes like uh, let's say two cords of wood in order to heat it for a winter. Uh, you know, I, I really don't know what it would be, uh, but let's say it takes two cords of wood. Uh, if you could cut that in half and use one cord of wood to heat it, that is an enormous time saving, uh, just not having to, to cut and stack and split an extra cord of wood. So it's not just about saving the planet, it's about saving you time, saving you money by uh, not having, uh, you know, heat that you work for just flying out your walls any more than it has to. It's funny, the, the, with Nate up close to the camera with that wide angle lens, it makes his Got house look tiny. Fiberglass particles all over me and I'm jumping out of He's my He's right seat. about that. When you work with fiberglass, it gets all over you. If you're gonna rinse off, rinse off with cold water uh, because you don't wanna be opening up your pores because that'll like let more glass in. So rinse off with uh, cold water and uh, you don't wanna be rubbing yourself because then you're gonna be rubbing the, uh, the glass in. So you wanna kinda like get a sprayer. Like if you have a hose with a spray attachment, that's the best way to get that uh, fiberglass off you. But the, the best way is to not get it on your skin in the first place if at all possible. And definitely, I don't know if they're wearing respirators in here, but uh, you know, respirators are a good idea. You, glass fibers get up in the air and my God, man, you do not want that shit in your lungs. But we finally right. have built it. It's looking beautiful. It's looking beautiful and he must feel great. It's a great feeling. The scaffolding really helped a lot, okay? So if we didn't have that, this probably would have taken us twice as long. It definitely helps. Having... I did use some scaffolding uh, when I built this place. I borrowed it from someone. <laughs> they still have, two years later, they have yet to pick it up. It's still just rusting off on the side. It was rusty to begin with. I'm not destroying it on him. But uh, having the scaffolding really helps a lot just for being able to, you know, when you're working, you're oftentimes working at a certain level at a certain time. And it's great to just be able to walk across that level back and forth, nail, 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 or screwing or whatever you're doing. Five people and a crew of uh, <clears throat> hungry communists with you to help yeah, you out. can see uh, the guy was like holding, uh, holding down the board while Nate is uh, uh, hammering it down. Uh, that is, uh, that's a great way of doing it, keeping the tension on while it's getting uh, hammered down. If you're doing uh, that kind of thing yourself, you want to be putting pressure and, uh, and doing the hammering at the same time so that you're, you're uh, preserving the gains you make. So we're back on the final day of the- So I think this is it's a three day build. So this is his third day. That's fast, that's really fast. Put together around the house. What we're gonna do today is we're going to wrap the roof with this house wrap. Then we're going to put a layer of this continuous wall insulation, silverboard graphite, which is styrofoam with mylar uh, exterior. Then we're gonna put on some insulated tarps over top of that. And then over top of that, the, we're gonna put on this metal roof, which is called Galvalum and that is going to just give us obviously the rain protection and it will reflect some of the sunlight as well. It's got that nice reflective color. Okay, so uh, he just talked about what they're gonna be doing for the roof. Uh, so first they're gonna do a uh, moisture barrier, uh, like Tyvek, Tybar kind of roll. You can see it uh, just uh, to his right or left of him. Uh, and then the, after that, they are going to be putting down some insulated uh, sheets that have some mylar, uh, you know, for uh, infrared uh, reflecting of heat. 
uh, and uh, then they're, they're putting over uh, something called an insulated tarp. Uh, I'm not that familiar with insulated tarps. I've uh, seen them used sometimes if a contractor wants to pour concrete and it's kind of cold, uh, a, a chilly time of the year, they may pour like a footing for a house. They'll pour the concrete and then they'll put like the insulated blankets over it or sometimes they'll just put the insulated blankets down uh, once they've excavated in order to try to preserve the uh, the warmth of the ground because the ground is natural geothermal heat coming up and if they want to prevent frost heaving before they do the uh, uh, the footings sometimes they'll put down uh, those blankets I don't know what the R value is R value refers to the insulating uh, 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 quality of, of material um, the, the higher the number uh, the more it insulates uh, uh, this is another kind of issue that I, I, I have with it, and I mentioned uh, insulation later, is that I, I don't feel like they put hardly any insulation on the top of that roof. It's, it's like almost a vanishingly small amount. Uh, those little panels are so thin, I can't imagine that it's more than like R2, maybe R3, uh, that they're getting out of those panels. Now they do have the reflective kind of um, a mylar coating, and uh, that, that's going to help uh, you know, uh, keep heat from uh, baking the structure from uh, coming in from the roof. Uh, and uh, if they have the, the silver on the bottom side too, that'll help with losing some heat. But there's almost no insulation on this. Again, also the insulated tarp, I can't imagine that's you know, any more than R3, R5. So you've got like a total of, you know, liberally, uh, you know, I'm thinking maybe you have an R value somewhere south of 10 or so uh, for that. And uh, it's probably closer to like five or something like that. And it, it's just not very much. Uh, the, the house that I'm in right now, we put uh, four inches of urethane foam on the walls and six inches on the roof. Uh, urethane foam has like an R value of somewhere around like 15 or so, I think. Uh, for uh, for a two-inch sheet, um, and they also have the the uh, uh, the mylar kind of coating on them. So like our walls are somewhere around like 30 or so, and you know you're, you're getting close to 45 uh, on, on the roof. So you know you're comparing like something south of 10 to like 45 that we have on on our roof. And I think it would have been really easy to add more insulation to the roof at the very least. I can understand why adding insulation to the walls of this structure would not be particularly easy because uh, you know, you've got the windows you know, right there and if you're gonna be building thickness in, into the walls that would, you know, you'd have to build, like, build out like extra window sills or you know, make the, the outside uh, you know, stick out a little bit more. I can understand why you know, not insulating the walls at all as they, they do in this video might have had some appeal just because the way the structure is designed it's not really made to accommodate insulation but they very easily could have added a lot more insulation to the roof of this what i would have recommended as a bare as a bare minimum is two inches of some kind of rigid foam up there and um, what they could have done is just uh, lay, layered that uh, uh, foam up there taken some strapping that's like one by uh, one by three inch boards uh, screwed that down uh, uh, through the foam to hold it down and uh, if they run those uh, those pieces of one by three inch board uh, horizontally you would have a great uh, uh, attachment point for your metal roof to attach right down onto that foam. I think that would have added a lot of benefit uh, you know especially up to that uh, attic space that where most of the wall is ceiling so they could have Add a lot of insulation right there, and I think that was kind of a, um, an opportunity lost. And I have one other issue with the way that they attach these things in, in terms of um, a long-term issue. Uh, that, uh, well, we'll get to that in a moment. So I'm really excited to finally put the finishing touches on this. But place. again, overall, Nate did it, and this is so much better than than nothing. That <laughs> it's it. it, it I, I do not want that to be lost in this video. I'm critiquing a couple things, but the fact that he did this, it's great. It's great, and uh, the structure, it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful structure. It's just, you know, I'm talking about some things that I think could be improved. The first thing that we put over the plain wooden bunky roof was some house wrap for condensation. I think they actually could have skipped this. I think they could have skipped the house wrap because these mylar sheets are in a moisture barrier in themselves. And if they put some seam tape between those, they would be getting the insulation uh, at the same time as they get the moisture barrier. So I think they actually could have skipped the house wrap. In fact, on the house that I'm in right now, I skipped the house wrap because I used uh, mylar uh, uh, covered um, foam insulation sheets. But again, the thickness on these sheets, they can't be more than like a half of an inch. So the, uh, actually, sometimes it says the R value right on them. I don't, 
I don't see the R value. I'll, I'll pause it later if I see the R value, but the, you cannot be getting much insulation from these other than that reflective insulation. On some Mylar styrofoam insulation pieces, these will cost you around 20 bucks each from a local hardware store. This is going to minimize heat loss and add even more protection on the okay. roof. One issue that I have with the way they attach these is that they're, they're using these nails and they're putting them in with the nails. Um, I, you would have to be really careful when you put these nails in that the heads are really sunk down below the surface. And uh, the reason for that is because when they're going to be putting the metal on top of this, now they do put the tarp on and the tarp kind of uh, you know, solves some of this issue, but if you were to build this and you did not put that extra insulated tarp on there, uh, the nail heads on there could make contact with your metal roof and with the different uh, thermal expansion coefficients between the wood structure and the metal roof, which you know there is a lot of difference there, you, you're going to be having the wood and the metal constantly kind of like uh, change their orientation against each other. Uh, you know, it's just that's just a natural thing uh, due to the fact that you know one of them expands more than the other uh, due to heat. And if those nails are sticking up at all, and you've got that nail head touching the metal roof, you could have it kind of scraping through. Uh, and again, if they really sunk the nail heads, they'll be fine, but you'd want to make sure you sunk those nail heads. And the fact they put that, that insulated tarp over the whole thing, that, that's going to act like a pad. So I, I, I would not worry about this structure, but if you ever did it yourself, make sure those nail heads are down and not, not sticking up at all. This next step is totally optional, but we decided to go over and above to put that. Again, I do not see this as over and above. This is, in my opinion, this is not even bare minimum in terms of insulation. Um, it's more than nothing, and that's good. But uh, it would have been so easy to put a nice, thick two inches of foam up there. And um, I feel like that was an opportunity loss if they didn't do that. Extra layer. And what we did is we used some insulated tarp over... Those grommets that you see, they might potentially cause some of that rubbing issue. But you know, I, I think they, they would probably get dragged around with the, with the metal roof, so probably not. But um, again, you, you don't want metal rubbing on metal. ...of our Mylar foam insulation. We layered, trimmed, and then stapled the tarp layer together. This is just going to provide even more rain and moisture protection. Once we got the metal... I don't think they really need any rain protection at this point. The metal roof is going to serve them just fine. But, you know, if it ever did develop a leak, it is one extra line of defense. They're putting on flashing right here, which is good. ...on. We are ready for the final step in the application of our... Of course, if you ever did get rain on this orange tarp here and it did run down, the way they're putting the flashing on top of it, the rain would run under the flashing as opposed to over it. No roof. Before you apply your metal roof, understand that this is a very sharp material. This is typically where injuries happen when working with this stuff, especially if you have to make your own cuts into the material. That's good advice. <laughs> when you cut that stuff, it is very sharp, uh, so you got to be careful with it. it. Looks like this uh, this metal roof also has its uh, um, screw points uh, or nailing points um, pre-drilled uh, through it. That's not, in my experience, generally the case. Uh, and it's a good thing because you don't know where you might want to do your connection points. But I guess with the kit, they, they pre-drill the holes. If you ever work with metal roof and it doesn't have pre-drilled holes, it's not a big deal. Uh, if you're putting a, a screw uh, down to hold it down, you need gasketed screws with little rubber gasket heads. Uh, you just take the screw, put it wherever you want to uh, hammer it in, and you just tap it with a hammer and that uh, gets it to gouge down into the metal and then you can drill it in from there. So it's not a big deal if you don't have pre-drilled holes. So exercise extreme caution and if possible, use gloves. We pre-drilled... Oh, they pre-drilled they pre the Much on. easier okay. later on. Then we got everything bolted and hammered in. And finally, the cherry on There's top was this custom-made deck that we set down in front of the bunkie. There's a fun shot Great to get. finishing touch to make it really feel like home. All right, guys, after four days, we finally completed the Ultra Haven bunkie and it looks amazing. It turned out, I think, as good as we could have possibly wanted it to turn out. Everything is orthogonal as all hell. It really did come out nicely. And I wanna reiterate again, uh, because uh, it's really, really important uh, to note this, that while I have a couple of concerns about the way this thing went up, the fact that it did go up, that is that is the missing piece that most people here on YouTube, you know, don't, uh, don't end up uh, you know, making happen for themselves. It is not enough to just get on here and watch videos. And I think we're done watching this video. I think we've, we've seen the whole process. It's not enough just to get on here and watch videos and, and critique. Uh, I, I, I think that that is just a way of people um, kind of legitimizing their lack of action, that they, if they can find some 
some downside about something that somebody is doing uh, that legitimizes the idea that they aren't going to do anything for themselves. And that, that's a psychological uh, kind of uh, a defense mechanism that I think that a lot of people use. Um, and I, I think oftentimes they, they probably feel on the inside as though their critiques of other people are uh, uh, something that is harming that other person. Like if someone comes to my channel and sees something that I do and they you know rip into it and they, and they tell me about how stupid it was that I was doing, uh, that whatever that thing is, um, I think they have the impression that they are harming me with their, you know, their bitter words or whatever. But really the only person that they are harming is themselves because they are the one sitting there, they're not getting off their butt, and you know, they're not actually doing anything. And that said, I know there are people that get you know, on my channel and they critique what I do and they are people that get out there and do stuff. And that kind of, uh, you know, positive, constructive uh, criticism is uh, good for everyone involved, including the person, uh, you know, doing the receiving of it, because if it comes from someone that knows what they're talking about, uh, you know, that's a way that we can all all learn and all grow. So uh, in me saying this, it's not my way of saying, you know, people should stop, you know, uh, uh, looking at any of the negative aspects of anything. And you know, let's just look on the sunny side of everything, because, you know, those negative aspects are real and they actually exist. And that's, you know, what this whole video is about. Uh, but if you use the fact that you're identifying problems in what other people are doing as a justification for you not to get out there and do things on your own, you're harming yourself in an enormous way that I think most people just aren't aware of. So I don't know whether for you this kind of thing is possible, but if you are a prepper and you have the financial means to get a little bit of land and to get something like this out there. And by the way, the pricing on these kits, I think it is pretty fair. I was looking at the pricing on them and you know, for the, uh, the materials that you're getting, the fact that it is selected lumber and the fact that it's pre put together, uh, not pre put together, but pre cut and everything, uh, the prices on this are very competitive, very fair. I can't, I can't complain about the price point on these guys at all. If you have the means to get land, if you have the means to put something like this up uh, and you're not doing it, and you consider yourself a prepper, uh, like how do you consider yourself a prepper? Because um, there, I think there are better ways of doing this. Uh, you know, if you have the, uh, the expertise and the experience in order to do something you know, more on your own and just getting dimensional lumber and kind of throwing it up, you could save a lot of money not getting a kit. So, you know, if you have the means to do that, by all means, do it yourself and, you know, uh, you know, come up with your own way of putting it together. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that and you're going to do nothing as opposed to putting together something like this and you have the means to put together something like this, I think you're out of your mind if you consider yourself a prepper because an asset like this is so valuable and for all you know, the, the negative aspects of it that I mentioned in this video, it is overall positive. 90%, 95%, this is completely wonderful and so much better than nothing that I would encourage you to, you know, look into this. Uh, I'm going to link to Canadian Prepper's video if you want to watch the whole thing in full. He's doing more videos about this, about his experience putting it together with more detail. And it's not just about, uh, you know, creating this kind of structure that you could use for, you know, you know, protecting yourself during an apocalypse. It's also about the fun and the, the feeling of empowerment that you get that you realize, man, I can make my own structure. I can make my own house. Every single animal species on this planet that makes any kind of a house makes it for itself. Humans are the only ones that have been tricked into thinking that, you know, if you want to have some kind of a living environment, you need to hire somebody else to do that because you're not qualified to do that. You can do it. Start with a kit like this. After you do a kit like this, I bet you're going to be more, um, uh, have a lot more self-confidence. And then maybe you graduate from this mini house like this to maybe building something small, uh, I'm sorry, building something larger and maybe uh, doing it a lot more DIY, getting raw lumber, you'll save some money that way. But this would be an excellent education. And you know, if you graduate out of this thing, you can use it as a storage shed. That's it. Thanks for watching. Hey, YouTube preppers, if you'd like to see my video series about building the house that I'm in right now, here's a link to it over here. In the series, I go through every step of the process, day by day by day, from raw land that's just forest, all the way up to the completion and moving in.